Hello and welcome to Politics War Room with James Carville and I'm Al Hunt. This week, our guests are the authors of This Will Not Pass, New York Times political correspondents Jonathan Martin and Alexander Burns. Remember, we love to take your questions, so write to politicswarroom at gmail.com or send a tweet to at Politicon for next week's show. We'll get to as many as we can, but don't forget to tell us where you're from. Please tell your friends about us and remind them to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcast. All right, James, this is a big week for us. There were five huge, or five primaries yesterday, two huge ones. And to coin that old hackney cliche, uh, it's the 4th of July, and we sell firecrackers for a living. So let's get at it. Let's start with Pennsylvania. That's that's the biggest one. Uh, John Fetterman, the Democratic candidate, just blew out his opponent, Connor Graham. He won, uh, Connor Lamb. He won every single county. Uh, he ran up a huge vote, despite the fact that he suffered a stroke, apparently a mild stroke, uh, four days before the election. On the Republican side, it's still out there. Dr. Oz... Uh, the celebrity, uh, uh, (laughs) I don't know what you call him, the phony medical peddling doctor on television and David McCormick, the billionaire hedge fund guy who was so friendly with China, are in a dead tie. The woman that we were all looking at, Kathy Barnett, uh, she she proved she wasn't ready for the Kentucky Derby. She was no rich strike. She kind of faded at the end. That Republican contest will go to a recount, and it it, it may be weeks or even months before it's settled because these two rich guys, neither one's going to give up easily. And, James, I'll just say finally in this, I thought, and I said before I wrote, that I thought Fetterman was probably an underdog in a general election. He's different. Six, eight, tattooed, campaigns in a gym short and a hoodie. Um, he, he just didn't seem to me the type that was going to be able to win statewide. I've changed my mind. I think it's at least a toss-up for three reasons. Number one, the Republicans nominated a guy named Doug Mastriano, who is the uh, fringe of the fringe. He was down at the Capitol on January 6th last year. He's a stolen election guy. He really is a, he's a nutcase. And I think a second reason uh, is I think the abortion issue is going to help Fetterman, in large part because Fetterman believes in pro-choice, and McCormick and Oz will just go through the motions uh, of being anti-abortion. And finally, James, there is some advantages to being old. Back when you were in, I guess, probably a freshman or sophomore in college, I was an intern for the Philadelphia Bulletin, and there was a Democratic primary for the Senate. Genevieve Blatt and Michael Michael Musmano, and I covered part of it at City Hall. It stretched out into the end of August, and it enabled Hugh Scott, the senator, to win uh, in the general election, even though Lyndon Johnson was carrying the state huge. A protracted fight for that Republican nomination, uh, Victor, has to help Fetterman. Well, uh, let, let me start out by saying I, I was publicly for Connell Lamb. I, I, my reason was very upfront about it, as I thought he'd be the best general election candidate. Last night, I volunteered to head up the Louisianans for Fetterman chapter. I'm <laughs> totally aboard. I, I, I think that Fetterman has proved to be a, obviously a lot stronger candidate than I thought. Uh, there's a couple of things here, and I'm not being Pollyanna at all, but there, there are a couple of things here that, that we should consider. One is just what you said. They have a disaster for a gubernatorial candidate. Now, think about this if you're just projecting forward. They're going to, whether it, it, it's McCormick or Oz, I don't know, and we got a lot of counting left to do. They're both first time candidates. That's good. They're going to have to negotiate how they talk about Mastriano. Do they appear at, at events with him? Because, you, you know, Mastriano might be deadly on, on, on the main line, he might be deadly in Allegheny suburbs, you know, and places like that. But neither one of these guys has a relationship with that Trump base like Mastriano does. So if they diss him, they run into enthusiasm problems, they run into turnout problems, a lot of things. This is what you would call, what our friend Ed Luce would call, a sticky wicket. The other thing, you know, in addition to Fetterman being, you know, stronger than than I or other people perceived him to be, you know, it, it, it's, it, I thought, and I don't know how, what to read into it or not to read into it, but going into this election, 
uh, yesterday afternoon, I just kind of thought the Republicans would have much more higher turnout. They, 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 they much higher turnout in Texas, much higher turnout in Ohio. I know they're different states, but it was... And, you know, the truth of the matter is without much of a primary and no gubernatorial primary, the, the Democrats were maybe 100, 150,000 votes less than Republicans. I thought that was a, that. A, a very mild but but positive sign. And uh, they, 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 they got a lot left before they even decide who their nominee is. They have a lot of negotiating to do with Mastriano. Uh, Fetterman thought a little head of steam. Uh, whatever I thought our chances were in Pennsylvania yesterday afternoon, I think they're somewhat better this morning. And I, I, I mean that. It, it, it's not to say we don't have problems and the wrong track number and inflation and everything else. But sometimes what I've noticed about Democrats and sometimes myself, I obsess so much on the problems we have, we forget about the other side. I did an event, and I said, you know, when I'm in my own huddle, I said, man, this is a pretty sorry lot. And when you go line up at the line of scrimmage, you go, well, it got much easier. I did, I, and I honestly believe that. I, I don't know if it's a 50-50 chance. If it's 50-50, it was 45-55 yesterday. Uh, yeah, I think it's, so, at least, it's at least 50-50. Now, right. uh, James. Now, if, a couple things about Fetterman. You got to first of all, you got to hope his health holds up. I mean, I've talked to some doctors who know a little bit about it, and they say that that's you know what how he had a, a pacemaker put in that that's really quite routine almost that uh, it, it appears to be very mild and he ought to be fine. One trouble spot, an otherwise fantastic night for him. There were some Philadelphia black uh, wards where he ran really poorly. He finished third. There was a controversy about him at one right. point, which I think may have been overblown. He, he's got to make sure that he does, uh, he does well in that black community. Uh, so he's got some work Absolutely. cut out there. He, he didn't work it very, I mean, maybe for whatever reason, but he didn't work it particularly hard, but he's going to have to get that vote uh, unified come, come November. But I think, I think they can. I know Malcolm Kenyatta slightly, but he strikes me as the kind of guy that understands what's at stake here. I'm sure Connor understands what's at stake here. Well, Connor uh, came out as you said. Connor came out right away and said, "You know, I'm all for John Fetterman. I'll campaign anywhere for him." Good, good. And I would uh, guess Kenyatta will too. Uh, I don't know I mean, what Kathy Barnett is going to say about she said either she one. She wouldn't endorse any of them, but I, <laughs> I mean, they really savaged her at the end. I'm not a Kathy Barnett fan, but they, but the McCormick Super PAC and I think the Oz Super PAC actually put out blatant lies about her. They were so scared that she supported Black Lives Matter and defund the police, and uh, it, it it probably had some impact. I don't think she'd have won, but uh, it'll be interesting to see what she does. Uh, let's well, the only good thing about them lying about each other is they're not lying about us. <laughs> uh, James, let's turn to North Carolina, where uh, the Trump back candidate, uh, Congressman Ted Bund, Bud, a kind of obscure congressman, a gun owner, won huge over the former governor. Trump and the Club for Growth played a big factor there. Uh, the Democratic nominee is uh, f former uh, Chief Justice Sherry Beasley. I want to immediately say that my son works for justice chief justice beasley so i'm gonna be uh i'm gonna be a little bit uh, tepid in my uh analysis of it so why don't i just turn over turn it over to you in north carolina okay well <clears throat> you have to understand something all right bud has endorsed the rick scott plan and bud owes his victory to not only trump but an outfit called the club for growth all right now let, let me take 60 seconds to tell you about the Rick Scott plan. The Rick Scott plan says that everybody should pay federal income tax. The truth of the matter is people that make below a certain figure, and I'm sorry, I don't know it, but let's just say it's $50,000 a year. Don't pay federal income tax. However, as they pay payroll taxes, sales taxes, property taxes, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, their next dollar of income is taxed higher than Warren Buffett's next dollar of income. And so, but Rick Scott, one of Rick Scott's proposals is, is everybody has to pay federal income tax. So that means that you're a parking lot attendant, you're an agriculture worker, you're a home health care worker, you're a waiter, you're a hotel maid. I can't, I could go on and on. What good does it do? Your taxes are going to go up by more than a little bit. The second thing 
that's in the Rick Scott plant. Not discussed enough, but I'm, I'm sure it'll get some airing during the general election in North Carolina. If he calls for sunsetting, a vote to sunset Social Security and Medicare every five years, and if you don't think that they're going to do that, look what they tried to do in 2005 when Bush tried to privatize large parts of Social Security. Big sticking point in the late 90s with Newt Gingrich and President Clinton was is they wanted to privatize huge parts of Medicare, of which they were famously defeated, but their intent was right there. And when you talk about the tax on, on people that make under $50,000 a year. Remember in 2012 at the high-end event in Palm Beach when Mitt Romney was talking about the 47%? That's exactly what he was saying. Exactly what he was saying. Rick Scott doles out more money than anybody, um, but the kind of money that you want. It's, it's something called, and I'm going to be a little complicated here, but I think it's worth a, a engaging our listeners on this. There's something called 441 AD money, which means that the campaign, in addition to what they raise, with the limits that you have, can get from the Senate committees a, a, a set a, a eligible for set amount of money. In North Carolina, my guess is it's probably a million dollars, a little bit more than that, but that is that money is three times more valuable than dog money or pack money because the campaign can do with it whatever it wants. Right, they control it. it that, that, yeah, that's golden money, man. All right, I, I would take a, a dollar of that for three dollars of some third-party group spending money on behalf of my candidate. So this is, regard, and, and of course, you know, people say, well, it's just Rick Scott's idea, and, you know, McConnell says we're not going to do it. Well, that's it. So McConnell tells the Washington Post. The Washington Post says, well, McConnell said it. I believe it. That settles it. Who is going to believe Mitch McConnell other than the Washington Post? Nobody. And this is a, in a club for growth, is locked into this. That's all they're about. You know this. You worked at the Wall Street Journal for a long time. They've been carping about this for, for decades, about the people in the wagon or out pulling the wagon or makers or takers. That are right. They're specifically addressing the fact that a hotel, that they don't think a hotel maid pays enough taxes and a billionaire pays too much. That, that's exactly what they're saying. Right. And, and they can put all the cover up they want if you've been around this business in any length of time, of which unfortunately we both have, you even longer than me, you know that this is something that they've been talking about forever. This is not a new idea. And this is one of the worst ideas in, in the history of modern American politics. It doesn't come up to replacement theory, but it's pretty bad. And sunsetting Social Security and Medicare. Yeah, is every just five years. I mean, so you just you, wait till you get a Republican president, a Republican Congress, and that, that's the end of Social Security. Goodbye. Thank you. Out yeah, of here. Right, right. And uh, I, I, don't, I, I, I think it's, 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 it should be suicidal uh, if, it's, if it's handled right. You know, there were, there were some other, I mean, do you have anything else to say about the North Carolina race, James? Uh, I, I mean, I, to the extent that you get 80%, and of course you got that Madison Cawthon thing, which I'm not overly delighted about. I, I thought he was a sufficient clown that, that he gave me some, some pleasure in life and whoever, replaces him. It's not going to vote any difference. Oh, but James, don't worry. There are plenty of fill-ins for a Madison Cawthorn in that House Republican. Yeah, well, I, I hope I hope he gets a form. So. I, I, don't, I don't want you to worry. I actually, I think he's sick. I hope he gets some help. I uh, do too. You know, I mean, he's actually, really, he, he just, right. you know, he's just too young and too stupid. Yeah. And show um, let me, let me turn to some, some others. Um, first of all, I, I'm going to give credit to Ann Shields on this. Ann Shields made a, comment about a couple of weeks ago, you know, Trump has considerable clout in Republican Senate primaries, but a lot less clout in Republican gubernatorial primaries. Because when you vote for governor, you know, you're not thinking about, you know, all of his uh, crazy ideas. It's, you know, what I want, you know, in my state. I think that may be true. You know, he was, he didn't like DeWine. DeWine won in Ohio. He endorsed Mastriano at the very end of Pennsylvania. Didn't have any impact. He's going to lose in Georgia next week. And he lost badly in Idaho yesterday. And conversely, North Carolina, Ohio, maybe Pennsylvania, Georgia, where Herschel Walker clicked clear the field, he has a lot more clout in Senate races. Does that make sense to you? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm going to take a little issue with, with my dear friend Ann Shields and by way of husband Mark is a very close friend of, of Al and mine also for a long period of time. So, yes, Trump endorsed J.D. Vance, and J.D. Vance won the Ohio Republican primary. Right. Yes, Trump endorsed Dr. Oz, who, who I don't know, it's 55, 45 that he wins this, and, you know, it, yep. they still count votes. But if he's such an all-powerful, all-compassing figure in Republican primaries, both of them got 32%. Yeah. Which you can say that they wouldn't have been there without Trump. They'd obviously, J.D. Vance would not have won the nomination when it been a Trump endorsement. Obviously, Oz would have lost to McCormick without the Trump endorsement. But 68% of the Republicans in Ohio and Pennsylvania, and it's a staggeringly stable number, went somewhere else. That's true. Yeah, I mean, James, it, let me, yes, Ann is right. Uh, Brad Little just crushed that person he in, yeah. endorsed out in Idaho. You know, Mastriano won, but that there was, he did that to kind of save face. He couldn't beat DeWine. I mean, there's legitimacy to what Ann says, but I, I think she might overestimate. No, no, no. no. Let, me, let me quickly. I think I may have slightly misrepresented. She was uh, just uh, talking about governor's races. And just okay, well, he, she, it, it, she yeah, thought that it, Trump doesn't it, have as it, it, anywhere it's near. It's a legitimate point to say they is. pay more attention to him in, in Senate than governor's races. Right, but right. they don't, they're, they're not the third of them. Yeah, he's not winning governor's races. No, and he, he's not chalking up any big wins in Senate primaries. If wherever he wins, he ekes it out. Yeah. The next big Senate contest for him, James, is, is Missouri. Uh, there may be some before that, but that's a big one. He's, he's endorsed this guy, Eric Greitens. Eric Greitens is a guy who not only assaulted his wife, but assaulted his mistress. Uh, and uh, he's right now, I think, a little bit ahead in the polls. Uh, and I don't know who the Democratic candidate is in Missouri, but uh, if uh, I were the Democratic campaign committee, I'd make sure that that guy or that woman is w well prepared because Eric Greitens, even in a deep red state like Missouri, is potentially vulnerable. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> I don't know. It, it, when you read what he's been accused of, it, it it it's not only sickening and criminal. It's he's a pervert. Yeah. But I, you know, I guess being a pervert fits right <laughs> into that political party. See, Lauren Bobich's husband. I, I I don't know, but you're right. I I hope we get somebody who can do more than fog a mirror. But uh, it. it and if he wins, you know, we, you know, Claire McCastle won a Senate seat in Missouri and wasn't that, that long ago. It's a very tough state, but you can go too far even in Missouri. Yeah, I wish that guy who ran against uh, Roy Blunt Todd last Aiken? time. Uh, no, who was the guy who ran against Roy Blunt? Uh, really attractive young veteran. Uh, I can't remember his name. Oh, came, I, uh, yes, I know who you're talking about. He was a great guy. He was yeah. a roommate of, of, of Mike Sherman, who you know is my helped me teach my class in Tulane, right, and right. I just, I'm, I'm hitting a blank wall. Right, I am too. That's what happens when you get to be area, yeah, James. a lot of blank you know, walls. One final wrap-up on this, and that is there were a number of contests in the Democratic House um, um, races yesterday between the, uh, the, the left and the mainstream, if you will, and it was kind of divided. In North Carolina, the left suffered two defeats in congressional races, Pennsylvania, there's a race out there in, near Pittsburgh where it's really very nip and tuck between a, uh, uh, a justice uh, Democrat, Sumner Lee, I think. She'll probably be a squad member if she wins. Uh, but, it, you know, it hadn't been decided the last time I checked. The one place that the establishment, the, con the moderate, whatever have you lost, was in Oregon. But that was Kurt Schrader. Now, Kurt Schrader was an incumbent congressman, but he has been in, in absolutely in a tank to big pharma. He has opposed any kind of uh, action against high drug prices, Medicare negotiating uh, drug prices. And you know something? I, I, that becomes to me much left, less of a left moderate fight than uh, any Democratic congressman who wants to support big pharma uh, ought to be in trouble. I, I couldn't agree more. And I, I am hardly a justice Democrat. But for the life of me, I don't can't understand the reason why we can't negotiate, the government can't negotiate drug prices with big pharma. Of course, I know the reason. And Kurt Trader knows the reason. It's, it simply has to do with campaign donations and things like that. So I, I don't, I'm, I'm 
I wish people said, well, you're a moderate Democrat. I said, I'm not no such thing. I'm a liberal Democrat. Mm-hmm. And that's a, that's a bridge too far. To, you know, that, that's, a, that's a, a real bridge too far. I mean, that, that's just got your wrong priorities in order. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, it really is. We are joined now by those celebrated authors, uh, Jonathan Martin uh, and Alexander Burns. Let me ask you both. There, this is a much-discussed book. There are great anecdotes about Trump, about McCarthy and Biden. What is the overarching theme, either one of you? Uh, Al, I think it's a, an account of two years of political crisis in America told through the highest levels of both political parties. I, you know, we go inside the room, we get on the conference calls, and we capture uh, the the struggle to, uh, you know, uh, first to sort of make the democratic system work and uh, ensure a peaceful transfer of power, which of course, as we know, did not work uh, on January sixth. Uh, and then we we sort of capture the aftermath of the sixth in both parties and and how it has shaped both parties. And uh, it's also, I would just add, it's the first book on the Biden presidency, too. And uh, we go deep on his efforts to try to heal the country and unify his own fractious party with with some, you know, halting success. Let me, uh, there's a lot of attention to the Kevin McCarthy duplicity after January 6th. Uh, you have him on tape, and so you caught him lying, outright lying. But you, you don't have him on tape, but isn't Mitch McConnell, wasn't he almost as culpable in those perilous times in December in the first few days in January? I mean, he seemed to me to be just as, just, just as disingenuous back then. Those were the crucial times as, uh, as Kevin McCarthy. Alex? Well, right. I mean, I think that the the what you described as McCarthy's duplicity really comes immediately after January 6th. But of course, uh, the duplicity of, of sort of the Republican establishment as a whole comes between Election Day and the certification vote when they all see what Trump's doing. They all see that it's dangerous. Uh, almost all of them uh, believe in their hearts uh, that it's bogus and they say so uh, in private and they don't say so uh, in public. Right. We have this scene in the book uh, in early December before the Electoral College votes uh, where Trump Trump calls Mitch McConnell while he's in a meeting of Republican Senate leaders, uh, and the president is just on this tear. It's very familiar to what people have heard from what people have heard in public about how Brian Kemp is so terrible. Uh, he needs to overturn uh, the results in Georgia, and then he goes further and says, "If we can get Kemp to uh, overturn Georgia, then I've got Republicans in Michigan and Pennsylvania uh, who are willing to do the same thing." And McConnell uh, hangs up the phone. He takes off his glasses. He rubs his eyes and says, "We got to stay focused on Georgia." But when he says Georgia, Georgia, he means the Senate runoff elections there. Uh, he's not saying that they need to do something uh, about Trump's efforts to overturn the election. The decision to put uh, the sort of raw electoral politics over dealing head on with this emerging you know, political crisis of the president's own making is obviously a, a choice with some very, very dire consequences. Yeah, he really did. He put uh, he put his political interest ahead of country. He, you know, if that stolen election might not have gained as much currency, it's so dangerous to democracy if people like McConnell and Blunt had stood up uh, had stood up in December. And I want to ask you both too: if McConnell, after the Georgia fifth uh, Georgia runoff where he lost, if he'd shown some guts on Trump impeachment, uh, he could have gotten seventy votes and maybe maybe gotten rid of this this great menace. Al, it's one of the great uh, what ifs in modern American history. What if McConnell had gone home the night of the sixth and started whipping his conference and gotten 20 Republicans? And look, I, if you do the math, you can find enough between people who were retiring in 22 and those who were unlikely to run again in 24 or 26, along with the usual suspects who are more moderate. It, but it would have taken leadership, and it would have taken McConnell to have sort of, uh, you know, really spent some capital to try to excise Trump once and for all. But as the days went on, McConnell, I think, was just taking the temperature of his conference and basically bowed to them instead of trying to lead them. Yeah, boy, what 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 might have been, James Carville? So I'm gonna go to you first. I, I've just been scrolling through the George Packer review. Uh, of you and Jonathan's book. 
And Packer makes what I think is a very legitimate point. This is not a campaign book. This is really a, a, a history book. And as I understand it, when I, you know, I had lunch with y'all earlier, and you seem to be on the path of writing a cam- campaign book, and you've transitioned into something bigger. Can, can you just give us a little chronology of how y'all made the decision to, to do yeah. this incompetent book, which George Pack is, frankly, one of the best modern observers of American culture and politics there is. And it, please read this review in Atlantic. But go ahead. Let, let's talk about the transition from another campaign book to a, a, a real first take of history on some sure. no, that was a, uh, That was a very, very gratifying uh, a piece to read from George Packer, who we both have a lot of respect for. Uh, and, and look, what you just said is what we, we sort of uh, I think we always hoped that even if we wrote a campaign book, uh, you know, in, in air quotes, uh, that it would be a campaign book that would stand the test of time, that it wouldn't just be about uh, staff rivalries and ad buys in this market or that market, stuff that's interesting to like the folks on, in this conversation, uh, but that is ultimately pretty perishable. Look, I think that it was a gradual process. I think when COVID struck, uh, we understood this was not going to be a normal campaign, that the backdrop for this was going to be much more dire, and that we weren't going to get, uh, at least on the Democratic side, uh, because of the uh, uh, sort of uh, health precautions that Biden was taking, we weren't going to get the high drama of the campaign trail the way uh, political reporters uh, often do. Um, look, I think the murder of George Floyd, uh, Trump's uh, refusal to concede defeat in the election, then ultimately January 6th, it's just this cascade uh, of events that told us over and over, you got to go broader and bigger than this. This cannot be a book that ends on election day because the story of this political crisis uh, didn't end on election day. In fact, uh, the outcome on election day uh, was, you know, in so many ways, just an accelerant uh, for the crisis uh, of, of Trump's creation that happened in the week's Uh, and months after that. And James, the last thing I'll just say, uh, and I think this was an important piece uh, of the George Packer review, uh, and I think that you recognize this uh, uh, pretty clearly, I think the first year of the Biden administration is a really, really crucial element of this story, that if we were to tell the story of uh, the political crisis of the last few years uh, and end it with Joe Biden raising his right hand on January 20th, like, boy, does it miss the point uh, of, of just how rocky things have been and continue to be for the country. So, so Jonathan, uh, one of the... the Things that some Democrats feel. I mean, they like President Biden, but they think sometimes she takes the path of least resistance. I think you could see that, and I think one of the more interesting parts of your book, from the, from a Democratic standpoint, was the selection of, of then Senator Harris to be the vice presidential candidate. Can you like distill and take us through this story? Because I think there's a lot we can learn a lot from that. No, I think uh, it's an important reveal about Biden's approach to major decisions. And um, there was no real um, uncertainty about how this was presented to us as we reported the book. The Biden inner circle found uh, Senator Harris, then Senator Harris, to be effectively the the, the safest pick. The closest thing there was to a do-no-harm pick for very candidly, political purposes. They weren't considering governance. They weren't considering the succession, James, of the Democratic um, standard bearer in 2024, 2028. They were thinking in sort of raw, immediate terms. How do we get Donald Trump out of the White House and who can help us in that cause the best or at least be the least, uh, you know, of the sort of not so great, uh, the sort of least worst of the not so great options. And In that moment, I think there was consensus that she made the most sense. There was never a deep relationship between her and Biden. If anything, there was uh, a bit of estrangement because of how she attacked Biden in that first debate. We report in the book that Jill Biden was deeply uneasy about picking Kamala Harris because of what she saw Kamala Harris do to her husband. And I think to this day, the Biden inner circle uh, has, has never sort of fully uh, embrace the political future of Kamala Harris. It's not like she was sort of welcomed into the Biden inner circle and tapped as the heir apparent. Uh, That has not happened. I think you see that today in their relationship, James. Yes, I want to, in a little bit of defense, I'm going to turn it over to Al. Remember, it's Abraham Lincoln that picked 
picked Andrew Johnson and to, to win the election, and Kennedy picked Lyndon Johnson hardly because they had a warm relationship. We thought that they were, uh, you know, the way to win the election. But but That's I right. think that reveals that story reveals a a ongoing strategy of uh, just don't 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 do too much that, that too controversial within the party. Just just go along and get along as best you can. And right. I, I don't make hard it, decisions and basically don't take sides with either faction of the party. And you see that throughout the right. first year of his presidency. He never wants to fully be a part of the moderate way or the progressive way. He wants to have a foot in both camps. And obviously, when you try to do that, uh, you can keep harmony for a while, but eventually it creates challenges. Yes. Now, now turn back to I'll just make the observation is that, the, the, if you always take the path of least resistance, it, you know, sometimes I, I agree with making political decisions. I have no problem with that. But if if that's all you got, it wouldn't. Everybody knows that. They, they're all putting heat on you. But anyway, back, back to you, Al. Uh, Jonathan, I think the turning point, perhaps even more than the uh, than the legislative stuff for Biden's popularity was the Afghanistan fiasco. And you all write that he blamed that on his advisors. Which ones? I think he was not happy with any of his senior advisors, uh, including Secretary of State Tony Blinken uh, and, and and Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor. He believes that sort of uh, he was given information that that proved not to be accurate about the nature of the withdrawal. Um, they did not clearly expect to have the kind of uh, uh, a messy. Uh, and really historically damaging uh, images coming out of the American withdrawal from Afghanistan. And I think you're right that the you can sort of look at, at, at that point last August and sort of start tracing Biden's decline. It's not strictly about Afghanistan. It's about Biden's image and his competence and, and his ability to sort of, you know, run the ship of state. And I think at that point, there, there's really certain questions begin about Biden's ability to govern, and he's never fully recovered, Al. Alex, uh, you didn't say this directly, but I get the impression from reading this book that you don't, you all don't think that this White House staff is quite up to prime time or major league ready. Is that a fair assessment? Well, I think there are certainly elements of the White House staff that's very uh, sort of impressively credentialed and and sort of well studied in the ways of Washington in different respects. I think what uh, clearly is missing uh, from the White House staff uh, is and and this is you know look it'd be easy for us to sit here and say uh, the White House staff is mediocre. They're not sort of uh, sort of uh, you know Olympic class players. And I think that in some respects that would be true. In some respects it would be really uh, underselling the credentials and experience of some of the people closest to Biden. What's missing uh, is a sense of urgency and direction, and decisiveness from the president. Uh, more than anything else, right? I think, you know, we depict in the book how there are different factions in the White House. There are people who are more moderate. There are people who are more ideological. There are people who are more uh, focused on the Senate, people who are more focused on the House. And you know what? That's the story of basically uh, every White House. Uh, but what's missing here uh, is somebody at the center of the picture who will say, you know, uh, Ron Klain, I know that you get along with the Progressive Caucus and that you and Pramila uh, Jayapal have this uh, sort of channel where you're talking about uh, going big on Build Back Better. Uh, you know, Steve Reschetti, I know that you uh, get along uh, with the moderate Democrats and uh, Mark Warner and, and Susan Collins on the Republican side. But here's my agenda. And these are the boundaries of what we're going to try to do. And these are the trade offs uh, that we're going to execute. And look, I think staff could have served Biden better at a number of junctures. I think particularly the uh, lack of sort of deep familiarity with the House among the people who are closest to Biden yep. uh, was a real handicap at some pretty uh, important junctures. But in the big picture here, like the the uh, responsibility has to rest with the president. Well, I know. I totally agree with you. I also and, think, however, Al, that there, Al, there, I would there just is, add, if I could real fast, we have yeah. a scene in the book in the fall of 21 where Biden goes to the Capitol to address the House Democratic Caucus. And Nancy Pelosi and a number of, of lawmakers in the House are expecting Biden to say point blank, to the progressives, I need your vote today, uh, or at least uh, uh, this week, uh, to pass the infrastructure bill. And you have my word, we'll also pass Build Back Better, but I need your vote on both. Um, and we got to do infrastructure. And Biden never says point blank that I need your vote uh, directly. And so Pelosi, who is 
you know, privately horrified by Biden's refusal to sort of say it out loud, has to say it herself. But it's not the same as the president of the United States urging his own party for a vote. And in fact, you know, Biden, classic Biden mode is telling stories and he has this anecdote about Satchel Paige uh, that he just leaves House Democrats looking at each other, sort of wondering, what does he want us to do? And I think that well, gets to the heart of what Alex it, is saying. Ultimately, this is on Biden. It all ultimately comes to the president in every administration. He also doesn't have anybody who's a peer. There is no peer there. They're all staff people, and they're good staff people, as you say, well-credentialed. But most good presidents have a peer uh, or two. Let me, let me ask Good you a point. final question, then turn it over to James. You uh, you write about the so, dysfunction, the problems of both parties, and it's certainly true. But isn't that a bit of a false equivalency? I mean, the Democrats have ideological divides. They have confidence divide. The Republicans are embracing dangerous stuff, uh, a, a lie about a stolen election, uh, uh, refusing to stand up to a mob assault on the Capitol, really threats to democracy. And while both parties are screwed up, uh, isn't it, it? I mean, the Republicans are far more dangerous. Either one. Of I mean, them. Al, I think that we say we say very much uh, uh, we say things that are very similar to that in the book. I don't think it's a false equivalency at all. Uh, mm-hmm. Look, we have one political party that is in thrall uh, to a dangerous demagogue who's attacking the roots of the democratic right. system. We write that. We don't uh, pull any punches on just how dangerous uh, the drift of the Republican Party uh, is in that direction. But we also felt really strongly coming into this that if the story uh, that we tell ourselves sort of as a country and certainly as a press corps uh, of the last few years is that American politics is in a pretty bad place uh, because of Donald Trump and the Republican Party, that would be a pretty narrow uh, and simplistic tale as well. Because you do need to have, uh, ideally, you would have two uh, parties in the country uh, who uh, that were relatively coherent, um, basically serious about government, uh, understood their own co- uh, coalitions uh, and priorities, and when they had power, uh, were actually able to execute on some of it. Right now, we don't have any party uh, that fits that description. And that's a, that's a danger to democracy, too. James. Okay, I, I respect your time, so I'm going to go to you, Alexander, and finish with you, Jonathan. This is the question. How close did we come to blowing a gasket on January 6th to 2021? Was, was there a point where this, this thing could have gone just horribly? Is it, yeah, I mean, it we went pretty said, badly, uh, but as we, say, as we say in the book, it could have gone so much worse if they had not evacuated the members uh, quickly enough, if Mike Pence or Nancy Pelosi had been uh, caught by a rampaging mob, uh, it could have been orders of magnitude more dangerous for the country. And I will say, uh, James, this is not something that we uh, really say in the book, but you know, there are other countries where in a scenario where you had the incumbent president uh, having been defeated but refusing to leave office, and you had basically in- the entire legislature sequestered in secure locations and military bases, uh, somebody with a uniform would have gotten some ideas about the opportunity uh, in front of them. And so I'm not saying that I think we came very close to like a seven days in May situation, uh, but I think we're really, really fortunate that the political culture and the military culture of this country uh, didn't make that an easier thing for somebody to contemplate. Uh, Jonathan, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, I mean, I would just say... um, I think what saved us is the individual choices of individuals. Alex mentioned sort of military, um, the leadership, and obviously a lot of people were silent, but there were some in the military who, of course, um, were not going to sort of let the country's democracy uh, collapse. And I think Mike Pence could have made a very different decision on January 6th. If Mike Pence bows to Trump's pressure and, you know, even delays the ratification of the Electoral College, that would have created a constitutional crisis, um, you know, basically 10 days before Biden was to be sworn in as the next president. And that would have taken us to really uh, unprecedented uh, territory uh, in, in, in modern American history. So I think it could have been a lot worse, both constitutionally and in terms of the physical threat to lawmakers in the Capitol itself. But we were close. I mean, I think we were we were minutes, if not seconds Away, And I think if not for the lawmakers being evacuated out of the Capitol building itself uh, into the tunnels, uh, I think you could have seen uh, a lot more bloodshed. It's sobering to think about, and we we devote an entire chapter to the day of the 6th, but um, it could have been a lot worse, James. 
Well, thank you all. I really want to respect your time. You all respected us by coming on the show. This book is it's going to be, go down as one of the better history books of, of, of this century. And I think historians are going to be mining this book a long time as they write the inevitable 6,000 books on January the 6th. But uh, let me give you all credit. This is a superb book. Read George Packer's interview, and this will tell you more than you've ever known before. So thank you all both. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, James, now for the questions from these really, really smart, uh, caring listeners that we have. Tony, in rural area near Auckland, New Zealand. Man, that's the one, one country I haven't been to that I really want to get to someday. Oh, it's me too. so beautiful. Now, Tony, listen, this is good. Tony's been tapped to run for, I think it's called the Waiaku Local Board under the Labor Party. His district is a pretty conservative one. It, its equivalency would be like, he says, Virginia, how they flip from one party to the next. Even though this is a minor election, how do I go forward in an effective local election addressing the needs of the community within a pretty conservative district? Well, this is a problem that a lot of people face in politics around the world where they may not ideologically align with the majority of the district. What people are generally looking for is to, to tell people that you understand the district. And, and when you do that, you have to be as granular as you possibly can. You have to use, you know, symbolism and people in the district. You got to pick things that that you can do and advocate that would be good for people as a whole. But you, you want to position yourself as the kind of can-do guy and who's willing to get things done and let them try to paint this in a more ideological way. But you paint it more, I'm here to help people as opposed to helping a particular ideology. That's a pretty standard way to run, and it's actually as, about as good as it any you can where you have some ideological mismatch with the people that are voting for you. Good advice, Tony. And please write us and let us know uh, the outcome. How'd you fare? Uh, the next question is from Jonathan in Arlington, Virginia, right next door to me. He says, hey, uh, you know, why don't Schumer and McConnell meet and agree to weaken the voices of the extremes? AOC, Gosar, uh, Jordan, Omar, et cetera. I'm, I'm not even wondering about primary challenges. Just relegate them as much as possible. Seems like it would benefit both of them and their parties. Jonathan, uh, I, I really think you're off the mark on this. Number one, it's there's a great imbalance here. Yes, uh, Schumer and Pelosi have some fringes, but they are such a small contingent compared to the fringes that face not only Kevin McCarthy, but also Mitch McConnell. I would just remind you of Josh Hawley and Tom Cotton and the like. But the second point is there isn't a whole lot you can do to minimize uh, the so-called extremes in, in a legislative body. You can't take them off committees unless there's someone like Marjorie Taylor Greene. Um, you know, they have their vote and uh, they have their voice. So uh, I, I empathize with your, uh, with your desire here, Jonathan, but it's just not very achievable. Also, McConnell and yeah, Schumer but, barely speak to each other. But this is one of the, my kind of things that, that – I'll take a little bit on this. So people will come to me and say, well, James, you know, we, <laughs> we got our crazies and, you know, you got your crazies, you know, and, and, you know, we, you know, we need a, a, some kind of political party that will just meet in the middle. Yeah, we do have some people that are – I don't – crazy, but we have some people that are impractical, I think, naive and silly. And according to the Pew poll, it's 11% of the country. Over one quarter of their caucus is now siding with a hostile foreign power. That's not naive. That's not silly. That's evil. And and I, this is my example. I'll give everybody, I'll give it to our, our, our listeners and our questioner. If you had a daughter, a granddaughter, a grandson, a, a nephew or niece, whatever. And he came up and he said, uh, people, uh, I want to tell you, I got a job. I'm assistant research analyst in the office of Congressman AOC. Your probable reaction would be what mine would be. Well, you know, that's going to be a good experience, honey. I'd be probably going to run into many different people. But, but some of the things that, that, that you Boss believes that, I, I think, are impractical or, or, or naive, but, you know, have fun and you're going to meet a lot of interesting different people. Be, I think that would be most people's reaction. If, by, on the other hand, your, your daughter, 
grandson, niece, nephew, whatever comes up and says, people, I'm so excited. I just got a job as a research assistant in Marjorie Taylor Greene's office. At that point, you go to the highest building you can get to and jump immediately <laughs> because your life is over, okay? You're done. You're a gigantic failure as a mentor, as a parent, as whatever it is that you are. They are, AOC and Marjorie Taylor Greene are not, remotely comparable in their extremism, uh, patriotism, or anything else. And, and that, that's an easy place, to, that's an easy pit to fall into because it makes so much sense until you stop and think about it. And again, there's much less of them, and none of them that I know are particularly evil people at all. They, they, I think they're naive, but that's okay. I, th I think some of the stuff, this language obsession is, is more or less silly, but it's also, for the most part, harmless. Russia is neither silly or harmless at all. Well, James, that leads... So we shouldn't conflate the two. That's, that, that really leads to our next question, uh, because it really is a, is, a, is a good one. I also would say, by the way, a former student of mine from Penn is AOC's uh, communications uh, director, and she is one impressive and accomplished woman. I don't agree right. with AOC and some things, but I got to tell you, when people like that uh, really are, are valuable public servants and your absolutely. distinction is, is absolutely right on. Bill in New Orleans, this picks up on what you've been talking about, wants to know, with the public heavily in favor of aiding Ukraine, why doesn't Biden spend more time communicating the serious and coordinated U.S. efforts and contrast that with Trump and his general infatuation with Putin and his, and his statements uh, praising autocrats. So I'm not a foreign policy person. Uh, you, you obviously have a great deal of experience in reporting on it and being around it. it. I think Biden's got to be a little bit careful as to how far out there he is because the Western Europe response has really been gratifying in this. And I think if he made it too much of an American-led, inspired effort, that, that, that that would not help the, these politicians and governments in Europe who are, who are coming around, for the most part, doing the right thing here. And I, I don't think he should lead from behind. I don't know, but I'm not saying he should, if he leads from ahead, it shouldn't be from very far, far ahead. He, he has to keep his partners. He has to keep the his, people that, that, that are helping with this uh, in line and part of a coalition because if you do what most people believe, this is going to be a pretty long slog, and we got to keep people on board. And, and these our Western European partners, and other other countries like say uh, Japan and other people that are you know obviously Australia, New Zealand, uh, who are with us. We got to keep them in a coalition. We got to. I'm very disappointed in, in India. I'm particularly disappointed in Israel. Uh, they're taking a, a hands off kind of view of the whole thing. Like, uh, well, what did. Russia, the Soviet Union, have to do with the creation of Israel. It was the United States, Harry Truman, that did that. And I, I, I love the Israeli country, but I, I, I'm not very pleased with their government right now. Well, I agree with you. My, uh, James, you probably have followed this more closely than I have. My impression is they were awful in the beginning, and they've gotten a little bit better. And uh, maybe, that's, maybe that's wrong. Maybe they've stayed bad. Maybe. Anyway. They should be really good. Absolutely, they should. Where's the Iron Dome come from? It's about, and it's about democracy. That's what, I mean, Israel loves to point out correctly that in that troubled region, they are the one true democracy. Uh, and so if they want to choose between Ukraine democracy and Russian autocracy, that should be an easy choice. Um, ne the next question is Beverly in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. You know, I worked, I was a director of a bunch of community newspapers at Dow Jones, and I always hope that they would name me the editor of the Cape Cod Times. I always wanted to live up there uh, and work. It's a, it's a great place in the winter as well as the summer. Beverly says national laws, uh, gun laws, don't seem possible. Do you think some moderate programs at state levels could work? Well, you have those, Beverly, but the problem is this Supreme Court may be about to gut some of those. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and so therefore, it's pretty hard to say, well, I mean, see, this Supreme Court believes in, in, in state supremacy, unless it's something that doesn't fit their ideological agenda. So they have a big gun case coming up probably next month. Uh, and Beverly, I suspect you and I are going to be disappointed. 
I, I, I think the, the gun case comes out of New York State, yes. and they're challenging the, the sort of concealed weapons. So let me get this straight. Now they're going to say, if, if they go the way they, if they always go, I think they're going to say, you can't pass a law telling somebody they can't carry a concealed weapon. Boy, I really want to walk into a bar or an athletic contest with people with packing heat. That, that's going to end very well now, isn't it? And again, the, the progressive advocacy groups in Washington, I'm sorry, and, and the gun control people I put in there have basically been pathetically ineffective. I put women, reproductive health organizations in, a, in, in environmental groups and people that want to fight climate change. I, I, I think that all of us who, who believe that there's such a thing as reasonable gun legislation and that guns are a big problem, to all of us who think that this climate is a just gut-wrenching, awful problem, all of us who think that draconian method, methods of, of controlling women are odious to any, any anything we have in mind in America, I, I think that all of us have been in some ways let down by the leadership of these kind of groups in Washington. I really do. And I've I'm, I'm been, been in my so for a long time. Let's hope they're listening to you and, uh, and start to turn around. You know, James, this next, this next question is worth it, even though it picks up on some stuff we've already talked about, just for the life experiences of the questioner. Doug. Doug is writing from Spain via Kev and Jacksonville, Florida. Now, Doug, Doug is a guy that uh, has, uh, has been around. So he asks, are there any races you can think of, I mean, we were talking about this a minute ago, where the Republican candidate is pro-Russian or against assisting Ukraine, I can make calls for the opponents. I mean, which ones, which candidates can we identify? Can we at this stage? Uh, well, Brian Paul. Yep. Who's on, actually on the ballot. Booker got the Democratic nomination. I'll be honest with you, I don't I mean, it's Kentucky, but, you know, I've got 57 different House members. i got to see which one of them are running. You know, good research. But there is a huge pro-Russian sentiment in the Republican right. Party, led by whatever you want to say. Tucker Carlson is probably the most powerful person in the Republican Party, is out front pro-Russian. Out front. So, Doug, I tell you, everybody, I, 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 I don't know how people are not even more outraged. Doug, I tell you what you can do: check two, um, uh, two sources: the Cook Political Report or the Rothenberg uh, Political Report. Right? That's it's not called Rothenberg anymore, but 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 you can look it up and get what it is. And look at the races that they call toss up or lean Republican, and then and then um, cross reference that with those fifty seven Republicans who voted against aid to Ukraine in the House. And if any are in there, then you can go and you can make calls for their opponents. Uh, James Marty in Perth, Australia. Man, we're doing great in Australia and New Zealand today, aren't we? Where's Marty from, Al? He's from Perth, Australia. Oh, Perth. Oh, okay. Well, that's extreme. I've never been. I always wanted to go. It's way out and face the Indian Ocean. I haven't, yeah, right. I haven't been to Australia. I know you have. Thunder down under. Sydney is great. Someone told me that uh, the capital is not the most exotic place in the world in Australia. It's Canberra. Yeah. It's like, yeah. It's like Brasilia. They just invented a city to have a capital. But, you know, Ambassador Caroline Kennedy is going to brighten it up when she gets there. Marty in Perth, Australia says, if Chief Justice Roberts is really concerned about the reputation of the court, do you think he would internally threaten to resign or actually resign his seat to protest at the conservative politicalization of the court? John Roberts is a profile in courage. There is no chance in the world of that happening, Marty. I do think the chief is concerned about the reputation of the court. He ought to be. Uh, this court is held in lower standing at any time in modern memory, uh, but I don't think there's any chance there's going to be a resignation, but I don't think there's much he can do about it. Well, this is something that, we, as we go to November, uh, people say, and I, I think I'll be the historian here, but that efforts to run against the court or make the court a big issue in in presidential campaigns generally not had a great effect. It would probably have some effect on turnout that favors the Republicans a little bit. But all of this has transpired when the court had a, you know, 65, 70, 75 percent approval. Now it's way underwater. It, it's made itself vulnerable to attack. And, and I'm sorry 
that a Supreme, how could a Supreme Court justice think that the Supreme Court can't be criticized? Of course it can. And part, is there a lot to criticize in addition to just throwing any kind of precedent out of the door? Ethically, they're all challenged. They, they're guided by no rules. They do everything on a shattered document. They, they do whatever they want to without any regard. And, and I, I, I'm serious. If I'm a municipal court judge in Bucky, Louisiana, I'm a little bit, why should I follow any ethical rules and the goddamn Supreme Court doesn't have any? And that, that's the kind of logic you can see coming up time and time again. It, it, they are getting a terrible reputation because they really worked hard to get this reputation. I mean, this has been a, a all-out effort yeah, and on behalf of people like Clarence Thomas to degrade the court. With a big assist from Mitch McConnell. Um, yes. Finally, Linda in South Lake Tahoe, California. Where, you know, there, there are some pretty cool places that are people are writing from. She says, what the hell is wrong with Merrick Garland? Why hasn't the DOJ brought charges against Donald Trump? How much longer do we have to wait? Uh, Maybe not as long as you think. And I I was a Merrick Garland skeptic early on. I I, I can't tell you that I'm a Merrick Garland, you know, enthusiastic supporter, but I am, my skepticism is, is, is lessening by the day. I think he's a very methodical man. I think he will, you know, he's not going to do anything unless he's accumulated all the facts, which is probably an attribute in attorney general. But he's already requested for January 6th committee to uh, turn over certain testimony to him. And, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if you turn on to somebody calls you at 8.30 one morning and says, you're not going to believe this shit, how many people he indicted. I, I don't know that that's going to happen. But I, I think... I think the guy is like plowing and harrowing his field and he might be planting something. We might see something here. I, I don't know that, but whatever he does, it's, it's going to be methodical and it, it, it's going to be, 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 be in all likelihood very meritorious. Yeah, yeah, sure will be. Uh, okay, Linda, stay tuned because uh, you know, there may be big news coming up uh, in, the next, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, some of this, you know, is going to play out in conjunction with the January 6th committee investigations. And there's always, when a congressional investigation is going on, the potential criminal investigation going on at the Justice Department, you know, they're going to have to work out arrangements as to what goes first and what priorities are. But uh, I, I agree. And I'll tell you something. Our dear friend, the late Walter Dellinger, will be pleased to know, James, that you have tempered your views uh, of his friend, Mary Garland. Well, that has something to do with, with Walter, you know, in it's a little more understand. I, I, I've tempered it. I, I would put myself in the enthusiastic camp, but I, I'd say I'm, I'm willing, you know, to see that he's, he's got something. And then, by the way, these January 6th hearings are coming up soon, and I, I don't know, but I'm going to be surprised if they're not going to be pretty explosive. They're going to be in prime time, too. Yes. Yeah. And, and boy, you know, of course, events around the world, it might be the third story by the time we get through it, yeah. everything else. Yeah, who knows? All righty, we we love those questions, so please keep them coming. Now for the outrage of the week. Hey, James, let's understand. The problems with this Republican Supreme Court extend well beyond abortion. This week, the six conservative justices further gutted campaign finance law by removing any ceiling on what a candidate can raise after an election to pay off a personal loan. No issue of corruption, these justices said, none of whom ever has run in a campaign. Of course, these same conservatives say donors during a campaign give primarily out of belief not to curry a favor. But after to pay off the winning candidate's personal loan? Well, Justice Elena Kagan explained to her colleagues why. A winning candidate can return the favor with a vote, a contract, an appointment. It's an I'll make you richer and you'll make me richer. It really is uh, an outrageous decision. And then Justice Clarence Thomas. I don't know who's angry. We have a vote sometimes uh, sometimes with our listeners, James. Who's angrier, Clarence Thomas or Samuel Alito? Well, and of course, he may be not as angry as his unhinged wife, but he blasted the liberals for trashing conservative justice nominees, something he said conservatives don't do. Oh, really, Mr. Justice, you must have missed 
those Senate Judiciary Committee hearings on, on Judge Atanji Brown Jackson, when she was accused of supporting pedophilia, asked about her religion, how she defines a woman. Is that just good high-level chatter, Mr. Thomas? Well, I, I, and if you think this is outrageous, just wait till some of these new decisions that come down are going to be increasingly more outrageous. And if you ever could think of something that would foster corruption more than me going to a donor after the election that I've won and getting a donation and putting it in my pocket. I, yeah. It, 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 to it, repay your personal, yeah, exactly. Right. right. I, 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 you just can't, you can't imagine how bad a public policy this is. But in, in terms of horrific public policy, uh, stand by. You know, you've seen Shelby County. You've seen the draft of the uh, Dobbs decision. You've seen a lot of stuff. Hang on, because it's going to get worse. It's bad, and it's going to get worse. Mild rage is, by any observation that you have, Russia is easily described as a hostile foreign power. I mean, I don't know how you could deny it. They've interfered in our elections. They've hacked into our computers. They have attacked us about every way that you can. Uh, they don't allow free speech. They jail dissidents. And then they hold off without, without provocation or reason to decide to invade a country that was zero threat to them. In this past week, the House, 57 House Republicans, which is more than one quarter of the House Republican Congress, voted with a hostile foreign power. Now, when we were kids growing up, if somebody was with Axe or Sally or Tokyo Rose, they'd have probably been shot. And the, the Republican Party has become one of the most anti-patriotic groups in the United States. I don't know any other way to say it. It's, it's totally befuddling to me in, in ways that we couldn't imagine that are very gratifying, that Western Europe has rallied to the support of Ukraine. Western Europe is working with us. Finland and Sweden, it's a huge deal. We're applying to NATO in over one quarter of the elected, the elected Republican House members are siding with a hostile foreign power. That is an historic outrage. Which well, sure is. Sure is. Okay, please send us more suggestions for our outrages as well as uh, the questions. Hey, thanks for listening to Politics War Room with James Carville, and I'm Al Hunt. Don't forget to send your questions for us by email to politicswarroom at gmail.com or tweet them for next week's show at Politicon. To keep up with us, subscribe to Politics War Room on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. Please rate the show with a five-star review. We'll be back next week with another show as we continue our War Room planning. <laughs>